I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. With chess, there's this saying that reminds me of your book, only the good players are lucky. So Ah. two people play, one person loses, and I see this all the time. The person who loses says, ah, you were just lucky. You can't always think you're a genius just because you win, and you can't always blame it on luck or other people when you lose. And yet that's this natural evolutionary behavior. That's exactly right. It's hard to learn when you win, I think. Experience is certainly necessary for expertise, but it's not sufficient. So... I can give you 10,000 hours of experience in something and you won't necessarily become an expert. In order to become an expert, you actually have to be a really good learner at whatever it is. So here's the biggest 10,000 hour pack that I can think of. The more that you're willing to embrace uncertainty and just say, I'm not sure, the faster you're gonna learn and the fewer hours you're gonna need in order to actually get to expertise. I am so happy to have Annie Duke, one of the best poker players ever in the room on the podcast. How's it going, Annie? It's going pretty well. Now, you wrote this book, Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. Is that the subtitle? It it is the subtitle. (laughs) Yeah. Let's just call it Thinking in Bets. I think it's a lot easier. Yeah. Yes. It's a lot easier. And I always, I don't like how, I'm not blaming your publisher. I know Portfolio, they're great guys. I just don't like subtitles in general because I can never remember them. But they make you have them. Yeah, they make you have them because I think it does narrow it down for somebody who's just like browsing it in a bookstore. So I think that's that's good. I, I you know, I thinking in bets was you know that was the title. So then we worked on the subtitle a whole bunch in terms of well, okay, you know, how do we define this down? But. And I'll I'll describe the book in a second, but I just want you to know I've already made about three decisions today based on the principles in this book. Are you serious? Yeah, obviously nothing having to do with poker. Of course not. And your book is not, your book is just, poker is kind of an example, but you have many other examples, but it's a whole philosophy about how to think and make decisions in situations that we don't, uh, how to describe it? Let me me describe it in a different way. I'm going to back up. So I feel like there's two aspects to this book that's really strong. Uh, one is how do you learn things that are very hard to learn? And one is how do you make decisions in situations that are much more complicated than you think? Which is pretty much every situation is more complicated than you think. Right. And by the way, you kind of differentiate poker from chess, but we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Poker being a game with hidden information. So often the decisions have to be made without knowing all of what's going on. Uh, you know, sure, you know and that's not to say. I mean, obviously, there's some there's some hidden information in chess, just not in terms of the pieces, right? So you, right. you can see the whole position on the board. I don't know, for example, what what opening you might have been just studying as that's an right. example. So, so, so that a, would be hidden so information. So like a pregame in chess. thing, or, right. or, or but but 
But you know what's interesting though. What, what really made well, I'll get to the kind of distinction between learning and decision making in, in a second, and then we can. I want to start asking you questions. But with chess, there's this saying that reminds me of your book: "Only the good players are lucky." So, ah. like, like two people play, one person loses, and I see this all the time. I get this all the time. Uh, the person who loses says, "Ah, oh, you were just lucky." And you talk about this concept a lot in your book, but it happens in everything. So, for instance, one time, this is 20 years ago, I sold a business and I made a lot of money. And I thought, oh, I made all this money. I must be a genius. <laughs> I sold an internet business at the peak of the internet boom. And <laughs> I thought I must be a genius. And of course, I instantly like blew the money in every possible way, like yeah. millions of dollars. And then if I had somehow gone out of business, maybe during the bust, I would have thought, oh, I was just unlucky to start the business during a, a bust. And so those are the two flip sides of both learning and decision-making is that you can't always think you're a genius just because you win and you can't always blame it on luck or other people when you lose. And yet that's this natural evolutionary behavior. That, that's exactly right. And, and I'll, I'll just go one step further and then we'll get to the to the questions. Just You could correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just kind of absorbing. No, the I like the riff. The, this is really good. I, I think the hard part when you win something, let's say that it's a game or you sell a business or, you know, I was just describing to you how I do, uh, and, and many, many of my listeners know I'm spending this year doing a lot of stand-up comedy. You could have like a great set where everybody laughs and you think again, oh, I'm a really funny guy. I'm a good comedian. And you'll forget to kind of really examine where you might have gone wrong, even if everything seems great. So I was thinking about just last night, I was doing well. But now when I think about it after reading your book, I'm thinking, you know, I could have tightened up this one thing. They were laughing. Everyone was laughing. No one would suspect that I was having a problem. But I could have done a little better if I had done X, Y, and Z. It's hard to learn when you win, I think. Like chess. Mm -hmm. when you When you lose a game of chess, you can look back and say, oh, I forgot my queen. I'm going about to lose it. But when you win a game of chess, you kind of have to examine every move and figure out, well, I'm obviously not the best player in the world, so I must have made some mistake somewhere, but it's hard to analyze. Maybe it wasn't necessarily a mistake, but there was just uh, maybe a preferable line of play. Maybe, maybe uh, you played a secondary line when there was actually a primary line that you could have gone that would have been slightly better. Yeah. Right? And it's, it, we tend to not go, just like you were talking about with your comedy set last night, when we've won, we tend to not go back to examine, well, I know that I did well, but could I have done even better? Could I have tweaked it? Could I have maximized a little bit more than, than I actually did? I think it makes us feel like we're not sort of getting to, I don't know, bask in the glow of the good feeling from, look how well I did, and I'm such a great actor, and I'm, I'm so um, you know, successful and smart and right. Yeah, well, and I think this is critical for learning, knowing when to recognize, okay, I can't let the ego get in the way here. I have to just focus on it's a it's a hot potato whether you win or lose. You you know, you can't you can't hold on to either for too long. You can't hold on to the bad feelings of losing for too long and you can't hold on to the good feelings of winning for too long. You have to focus on the learning so you can improve. And sometimes right. learning in these odd situations, learning even when you win. And again, I'm talking about winning not just in terms of games, but it could be business, relationships, uh, you know, sales, whatever. Uh, learning from the good moments, I think, is is particularly difficult. And so you might learn more. Well, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I love the example of the comedy set. Like, I was killing it. And then I thought today, well, maybe I should see if I could have killed it a little bit more. Um, I think that that's incredibly hard for people. And I think part of it, Something just struck me that you just said, which is like, well, you have to divorce yourself from the ego. And I think that what I would argue is, well, I think that we can kind of hold on to the ego because I think, you know, feeling good about yourself isn't a bad thing. Really? No. <laughs> I, I I think that you can go around and you can think, you know, I'm I'm pretty good. Like, I'm pretty hot stuff. It's just what you want to do is change what it is that makes you feel good about yourself. So I think that we're naturally born to your point of what makes us feel good about ourselves is, oh, that horrible thing that happened, that awful outcome, nothing to do with me. That was just bad luck. Oh, this wonderful thing that happened. I sold this company for a gazillion dollars. I'm clearly a genius. And we're kind of born to process the world in that way. 
why did we evolve that way? Like, why did the the our ancestors, not our ancestors, but the the humans who didn't uh, think that way, why did they die off? <laughs> Well, you know, it's always unclear when you're going back and you're sort of making up stories about evolution. Um, so I just want to make that clear. But there seems to be a, there seems to be a, a few things at work here. One is um, that we're really temporal discounters. And what temporal discounting means is that we will take a discount in the present in order to not have to sort of delay and wait for things in the future. So in this particular case where we're kind of offloading a bad feeling, and onboarding a good feeling is because of us. It's actually kind of a good example of this temporal discounting, which is we're taking a good feeling now that might sacrifice us being able to have better results and better feelings later. We really kind of live in the moment. The evolutionary reason for that is that if you have food in front of you, you should eat it. I mean, evolution builds us to, to survive day to day. It's not really thinking about, uh, I want you to survive year to year. That, that's a result of evolution. If I can get you to survive a day, then you're more likely to survive the next day, so on and so forth. But it builds it as a local rule. So uh, we tend to be temporal discounters just like because we evolved that way. You know, that that's that, that's super interesting. I never thought of it that way. And you you have some, uh, uh, you know, you know, one thing we talked about was how you describe learning, uh, whether you win or lose and, and looking at, at, at learning in a slightly different way. But the other part of this book that's really important, I think, is the decision making, which is that... Um, you know, how, you know, fighting some of these evolutionary tendencies on decision making and also coming to grips with the fact that the right decision might also probably not work out in the short term. Mm -hmm. But if you make this type of decision consistently in the long term, it, it could work or it will work out. Uh, and I think looking at probabilities in an interesting way with decision making, I think too many people want to say only make decisions that they know the outcome will be good when when you can't. Right, you can't. And it might be better sometimes to make a decision where you know the outcome will be bad, but in the long run, if you make this type of decision, it'll work out for you. Well, I mean, as an example, if you lived your life by that philosophy of I only want to know it would work out, you would only tell jokes that worked out in the past. Um, you wouldn't really try new material because new material is actually very likely to fail, certainly on the first try. Right, and yet in the long run, you'll grow and you'll learn and maybe you'll have better material. I'll yeah. give you an example from the business world. Let's say it's your first business that you're building and someone comes along and offers you millions of dollars, so it'll change your life. And But it's going to take six months to close the deal with all the legal and right. so on. What happens is this life-changing thing that's going to happen in six months, but you have to wait. And so every day that gets closer to that six months, the average person, or maybe just me, but I would say the average person gets more and more anxious mm -hmm. because we're not used to waiting for six months for some life-changing moment. Like anything can happen. Right. So if so, so it's all, often a smart strategy for the buyer to say, "Hey, we could like three months in. Hey, we can close right today if you just take half." And yep. everybody will say yes because I can't handle that anxiety anymore. Well, so there's there's actually really good examples of this in in real life, just the, these huge examples. So there was one where there was a, a military drawdown in the '90s. There were some budget problems, and so they offered military personnel who had pensions if they wanted to draw down the pension. Oh yeah, um, you and this so in the book. right, so many people took it. I think they took about forty percent of the value in order to just get it now. Um, don't quote me on forty percent of the value. Look in my book where you can quote from the book on forty percent of the value if that's what it I says think that's in there. What it says. But I think that that's what I think that's what it said. But we see this also in lotteries all the time. You know, somebody wins a lottery, and you can either take it as an annuity or you can take a one-time payment. Um, and when you take a one-time payment, you're taking a humongous discount on the money. So we're willing to take discounts in order to kind of just like get it now and get it over with all the time. Because then you have a great outcome. You made a decision. You get to bank it. Was, yeah, you have cash that you can put in the bank today. If you made the other decision, you had no, you have no money today. You right. still have to wait. Right. And there's uncertainty that in that and people don't like uncertainty. And that's kind of the crux of, of the decision-making part of the book. Mm -hmm. I kind of think there's like two halves to the book. There are. And, and, um, and also I just want to say from a writing point of view, I just love how you interweave all the different stories and your story. I think it's like really well written as opposed oh, to kind you. of being a, a, a dry book about decision-making. Like it's, is entertaining. Well, I think that I had an advantage because uh, this book actually was born out of uh, over a decade of speaking in front of audiences on this topic. And as you know from doing stand-up comedy, you really don't want to deliver a dry speech to an audience, particularly 
uh, you know, non-academic audiences. I'm speaking in front of like executive groups and companies and things like that. And you've got to get up there for 45 minutes and be able to hold their attention. So I think that you learn through that because you're kind of working, you, you end up having a real conversation with the audience because you're seeing how they're responding to what you're saying. And I just started adding in kind of more and more color um, and making the speeches less and less dry um, and kind of filling in the gaps with stuff like, you know, Seinfeld or, or David Letterman examples or Princess Bride or P. Carroll in the Super Bowl or whatever it might be, because it just helps to hold your their attention. And the more that you have their attention and the more that you can color it in with things that they're super familiar with, the better the conversation is, the more good you're doing and the more good they're getting from the conversation. So I, I really like um, that I got to basically workshop it with my audiences. And, and not only that, I guess if, through the public speaking, you also saw if you just told poker stories to to, to, to illuminate your examples, that wouldn't work either because no. maybe only half the audience knows poker, maybe only one tenth the audience knows poker at your level, or or you know much less than your level, but one tenth could understand the terms you're saying. So right, exactly, and you can see like this this book really you you never have had to have played a single hand of poker in order to understand this book. Poker's kind of a- acts as a backdrop to to fill in the examples, and then I've got all sorts of other examples from you know sales and legal examples, and like I just said, like the military drawdown or David Letterman or whatever it is. So poker's kind of providing a framework around which to think about uncertainty. Um, but if you've never played a hand of poker and you don't even know the rules, you're not going to have a problem with this book at all. No, I agree. And like I said, um, even just today, I probably use. I probably was thinking about this book while making three different decisions. I love that. And uh, I think one of them was on the learning side, and two were on the decision making. Well, I want to hear the decision making side. Uh, what well, one involves uh, some money, whether to wait or whether to whether to negotiate against myself, uh, and the other one involves a relationship. So oh. I, that's can't say. But, Got it. Uh, Keep that uh, private. Yeah, but uh, uh, let's you know. Again, I I, I think um, it's a super valuable book. I wanted to start off a little bit though with your background, sure, because I'm also fascinated with like how you know you kind of um learned how you learned throughout the years and you kind of get that into this book mm-hmm. but i'm fascinated by the topic of peak performance and essentially how to somewhat skip the so-called 10,000 hour rule or at least hack it a little bit you know so oh, 10,000 yeah. hour rule which is sort of po- not quite accurate but popularized by Malcolm Gladwell and Al Ayers says it takes 10,000 hours to reach your peak potential at, at something. 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. So you're one of the best poker players in the world. You know, when you were playing, you've been retired since 2012, but I'm, you still play like in charity tournaments and in stuff. In charity tournaments, I do, yeah. So I roughly know how you start. You 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 were getting your PhD at, at UPenn. For some really Go stupid Eagles. reason, you somehow moved to Montana. <laughs> I can't figure that out, really. <laughs> well, I'll explain that, but go ahead. All right, go ahead. Explain that. <laughs> no, no, keep going, and then I'll explain and then, it. And then, you know, you, your brother was already a professional poker player, gave you some basic guidelines, but then you kind of gradually over time became one of the best poker players around. You've won millions of dollars in tournaments and uh, and very successful at it. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I do think that there are really good hacks to the 10,000-hour rule, and I think most of it has to do with how efficiently are you learning and how much are you relying on the experiences of other people and being open-minded to them. So I think that you can um, definitely borrow other people's 10,000 hours, number one. That's a really key point. So you can sort of take saying, out a loan. <laughs> what you're also saying is community is important. Community is incredibly important. Um, and then the other thing, like one thing I want to say about the 10,000 hour thing is that uh, it doesn't matter how many hours I put into playing the violin, I'm going to suck. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of, you know, as you said, it's it's a kind of a loose framework within which to think about how to gain expertise. But I think that community can be really important for uh, as long as you're open-minded to the expertise of the community, it can really, really, really speed up your learning. Um, and I definitely had the benefit of that. I mean, my my learning curve in poker was very, very fast, mainly because my brother was already playing for 10 years, and he had landed in this amazing group of incredible poker thinkers from New York, including Eric Seidel, um, Dan Harrington, Jason Lester. There, there were a bunch of these people, and my brother was tightly knit into this community. So he had... Where did had, they all play, just out of curiosity? The Mayfair. So so what year? Because I was playing at the Mayfair every night, including the night my first child was born. 
Uh, oh, that's in awesome. 1998 and 1999. So they the, were probably a little was, before yeah, me. Yeah, they were a little before you. So he was playing at the Mayfair actually when I was in New York at Columbia. So this would have been, I think he moved to New York in 82. Um, I came, you know, I was there a little bit after him. Um, so he would have been playing at the Mayfair probably about 82 to, well, I don't know. I think it was about 92, then. 92 yeah. or so, maybe even a little later, maybe through 94. Um, and then he moved to Las Vegas right around that time. I think he moved to Las Vegas in 94. So uh, I would say it was about 12 years where wow. um, part of the time was the Mayfair. I think then the game may have moved a little bit, but it was mainly at the Mayfair. Mm. Um, so I, I got the benefit of being plugged in, right? These people had basically created their own learning pod. And obviously they're incredibly smart people. Um, they had formed their own learning pod around poker, and they had been doing this for a decade before I ever, you know, picked up a poker chip. So I got plugged into that community, and then they had particular uh, kind of rules about how you communicated within that 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 forced you to either get out or have an open mind. Like those and, were kind and of you your talk two- about forming those communities in mm-hmm. this book, which I think is very critical. I think I really do think this is the most important way to hack the ten thousand hours. Is if if you're just around the best in the world and you're open-minded and have rules for how to listen and communicate to them, it's a huge win. Like you say, you right. can borrow their 10,000 hours. Right, and part of the thing, I mean, there's something that I say in there, which is from Aldous Huxley, actually, to the point of the Gladwell stuff, is that experience is certainly necessary for expertise, but it's not sufficient. So I can give you 10,000 hours of experience in something and you won't necessarily become an expert. In order to become an expert, you actually have to be a really good learner at whatever it is. You have you have to learn at the about the feedback that you're getting, right? Um, is your audience laughing or not? What does that mean? How do I figure out? Maybe it was a bad audience and they were in a bad mood or it's just not the right audience for the kind of jokes that I want. Or maybe my jokes were bad. I, I don't know. And you have to kind of sort through that kind of feedback. And, and it's actually super hard. It's super hard because... For instance, what you just said is interesting. There's there, there's one dimension you could look at it was, did they laugh or not? But let's say they laughed. There might be 10 different reasons why they laughed, and you kind of have to understand what's the right reason. Uh, right. Because it might, that, learning that could be really critical to how you do the next audience. Right, and you could also, by the way, theoretically be in front of an audience that doesn't laugh, and it doesn't mean you're supposed to change your routine because it may not actually be the right audience for you. So you don't know. Like, I, I don't know your comedy, but I'm just guessing as an example, that an audience that would really like Andrew Dice Clay would not be your audience. Probably not. Probably not. So if you were in front of an audience where they were just huge Andrew Dice Clay fans and they didn't laugh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should go change something. So there's all these different reasons why you could be getting the result. And you have to sort through that in a way that actually pulls the signal out of the noise so that you know when am I supposed to go in and close the loop and actually change what I'm doing, change my beliefs and change my decisions. And without the emotion in there as well. Exactly. And when am I supposed to just sort of say, well, this doesn't really have much to do with me. It's a bad audience for me. You could ask yourself, do I want this to be my audience? Right. That's a question you could ask yourself. But you may end up saying no, at which point, well, okay, I'm just going to sort of shunt that off to luck. I don't really care. And this idea of how do you close that loop is really, really hard and there are things you can do to be better at it on your own. But this community hack, as you put it, is like it's so incredibly important to be able to actually get that to be done efficiently in a way that kind of gets yourself out of it. You know, now, community is an interesting thing because, for instance, you're, you were able to enter this high-level poker community because your brother was yeah, already super there. super lucky. But, like, let's say you start off playing golf. It's not like the next day you're going to start hanging out with professional <laughs> golf players no. and sharing tips with them. So entering into a good community is is a, a hack unto itself. Like, that's difficult. Yeah, so, but I think that when you come into any community, when you start doing anything, you can look around for the people who seem to be kind of the most reasonable and open-minded. And you can do that by sort of seeing what their stance is toward the world or what their attitude toward the world is, right? So let's say, for example, that you're you're coming in to play golf and you're not just going to necessarily be hanging out with the best pros in the world. To be fair, I mean, I was very lucky to be in that situation in poker. But you come into golf and, you know, you're playing in some foursomes and you hear some people just complaining about the wind and they hit a divot and, you know, oh, that you talked while I was during my backswing. And it's all these things that where they're just blaming things that have nothing to do with them. Maybe they get very emotional and they're like throwing their clubs, which means that they have some issues with with just sort of keeping their emotions calmed down, which is really important. But 
Then you see somebody else who, while a beginner like you, is talking about, oh, I wonder, like, should I be adjusting my swing? Or, you know, they seem to be pretty calm. And you see that kind of attitude. And yes, neither of you is particularly good at the game, but you can see that you could probably come together and help each other get better because you're both focused on the same thing, which is how can we pick the things that we actually have control over out of the feedback that we're getting? Well, well, I would say there's like three types of community. There's the community of people a lot better than you. Mm-hmm. There's the community of your of of those types of people where they're your peers, but they're striving in the same way you Correct. are, and and they understand learning in the same way you do, and and you're both able to to share and learn. And um and then there are even people below, not necessarily below, but people you could teach so that it help keeps helps you keep beginners mind in what you're doing, and you see from their questions. It re- it reminds you of the fundamentals that you always have to keep track of. So it's sort of this plus minus equal approach. So I love the way that you describe that. So I, I think that I was really lucky in my poker career to have all three. Obviously, I entered into this you know community of experts right through my brother. That was mm-hmm. super lucky. I clearly had peers when when I was playing who seemed to be like minded, and I was trying to pick them out of the crowd so that I could work poker decisions with them as well. And then eventually, I started teaching poker. And when I started teaching poker, which wasn't until right around like 2004, what happened was really something incredibly interesting, which is that my game massively changed when I started having to teach. And the reason was that when you're trying to teach a concept to somebody else, particularly somebody who is you know beginner to intermediate, and you've decided that some, some strategy that you have or some tactic that you use or some concept that you have of the game, you can't actually coherently describe to another human being it's a really good sign that maybe what you're doing isn't the best thing. Or you might not understand it as well as you think. You definitely don't understand it as well as you think. And if you can't describe it, you probably can't defend it. And it reminds me of something from John Stuart Mill. He, he's, he's obviously a, a philosopher from the 1800s, and he's very uh, clear on this idea that you have to have the clash of ideas, right? You have to be able to defend yourself. You have to be able to defend the truth against other people. And that dissent is really, really important. And it, it will tend to moderate what you believe. But he also says something else. He says, even if you think that your belief is 100% true, you are completely certain, if you can't defend it against another person, mm-hmm. the truth is atrophied. So I think about this in terms of there are certain truths that we, we believe to be certain, like the earth is round. So that's all fine and good. And you can go around with this belief that the earth is round. I happen to also agree that that is certainly true. But I also better be able to defend that belief against somebody who's a flat earther. Otherwise, what is the point of the truth of the earth is round? It's so funny because I can't defend it. Like right now, I won't be able to defend it. So I can say some things about, I I know some things about the horizon and how you view the horizon and, and things that have to do with, you know, the way that the stars are and there's some things that I know about it, but I'm not great with it. But I do understand that if you ask me to go defend it to a flat earther, I, I could find out a way to do that. And I wouldn't I wouldn't just say to a flat earther, you're dumb, that's not true. I would have to be able to have a rationale and be able to support my argument. So that was true when I started playing, po- when I started teaching poker. So now my community is community of people who are less experienced than I am. Um, and don't have the same level of expertise that I do. And my game actually starts transforming at that point because what I realized was some of the things that I've been doing for a long time, just kind of because the truth had atrophied, because I just sort of thought, well, these things have worked, and so forth, there must be true. So it wasn't, even though this gets into the weeds of poker a little bit, what's an example of how your game changed at that point when, when you were teaching? Um. So... Uh, I'll give you an example of something that I realized that I couldn't really defend. Um, I realized that I was raising very often too early in the hand. And the reason was that I would try to explain to somebody why that was a good idea. Like, you bet and I raise for me to try to show you strength. And it occurred to me in trying to explain this to somebody that... um, as I was talking about this conversation, you were having this again a little poker wonky, but as I was talking about the, the, this idea of you're having a conversation with someone as you're moving your chips around, that it suddenly occurred to me as I was trying to explain this to a class full of people that I was having the wrong conversation because if my hand were really strong, I would delay the play because I would try to reel you in. Mm. 
And once I realized that, I realized, oh, this thing I've been doing before where I just sort of naturally thought, oh, if I raise early, clearly it will sing- signal strength, that actually I was signaling quite the opposite. But it didn't really hit home for me until I tried to explain this to a group of individuals who are trying to learn poker from me. And let, and let me play just devil's advocate for a second. Again, not to spend too much time on, on sure. poker, but let's take a guy like uh, Gus Handsome, mm-hmm. who will always raise to sort of show strength and get everyone out, out of the Well, round. he does it before the flop. So I was getting wonky, but I'm talking about like after the flop. So, um, you know, the board is ace, nine, three, and I'm trying to say bluff you and you bet and I raise, it's not actually a particularly defensible raise necessarily because if I had a very, very strong hand, I probably actually wouldn't raise there. Because if somebody re-raised you right then, you're, you're, you're out. Exactly. And you're opening up yourself up to exactly that play. I mean, obviously this is getting wonky, but, but the point is that in trying to defend things that I had sort of accepted as kind of gospel truth for, for things that were correct strategy in poker, in trying to explain that to a community, in other words, I'm now having, it's, it's, it's a way to have to vet my beliefs, right? Because I've got this accountability to what I'm telling these students and I have to be able to explain it to them. So I'm now accountable to my own beliefs um, in this really interesting way. It actually changed the way I played. And very soon after I was, um, was teaching, I actually, like, that's like later on then I, I win the Tournament of Champions. And then, you know, I win my World Series of po- I mean, there was this big change that occurred in my game right around 2004, and it happens to be right as I started teaching poker. So so, so, kind of pulling it back to the learning, there's this meta-learning concept, which is build community, but there's three types of communities. Mm-hmm. And then there's really understanding what the purpose of those communities are. Correct. So, and, and that's a little more nuanced, but like, for instance, with the community of experts, you're not always going to understand everything they're doing, but you have to be able to communicate somehow in an appropriate manner questions and situations and see how they respond to it and understand what they're saying and ask them questions if you didn't understand and I, you know it's like you have you describe the conversation with Eric Seidel where um, you're talking about a hand and you said oh I had bad luck and he said I don't want to ever hear that again uh, this is how you'd have to talk to me about a hand or right, else exactly. I'm not interested yeah so they're they're basically giving you um like a thought paradigm. So the experts, the experts in whatever you're doing understand, for example, what the important details are, right? So they they understand the kinds of details that you need to communicate. So I assume in comedy, it would be something like timing, right? You have to say something about the timing. You have to say something about the joke that came before, what the response to the joke that came before, where you were going with it, how many people were in the audience, uh, were you early in the night or late in the night? Who did you follow? So what you're saying there is not just things to analyze, but maybe you're maybe you're dividing up uh, a moment into like the component micro mm-hmm. skills that need to be learned. So right. where you are in the night, that is specifically a skill. If you're first, that's a different skill you need to learn Correct. than if you're last. And if if let's say that let's say that you're trying to get advice from me. It, if I could give you advice about comedy, if you don't provide me with those details, then I'm not going to give you advice of any fidelity. Because as an expert, I need to know, for example, were you early in the night or late in the night? But what you're saying is also you're you're like a meta expert. Mm-hmm. So you're trying to you're t- you immediately are taking a skill and trying to break up uh, into Correct. the micro skills so you could build a picture and understand, and then use your uh, kind of more general techniques of mm-hmm. learning to break it down, to be able to give advice. Right, exactly. So I would work with you to figure out, so I'm saying, I'm assuming that these kinds of things are really important. We would create essentially a template of those kinds of details. So like, now- like if you're teaching sales, for instance, you might I be, would do the exact same thing, yeah. right? And now we've got a template of details so that whenever you're conveying, whenever you're asking me for advice, you're including all of these details so that I have the appropriate context within which to give you advice of high fidelity. One of the reasons why that's really important, and, and it's something that, for example, Eric Seidel, my brother, those people demanded of me, was that I'd be able to tell them certain details about the hand. What position was I in? How much did I bet? What, what were the chip stack sizes? What had happened before? What Similar things to the kinds of things I was just trying to construct with you. And, and I like how in the storytelling of the position, the outcome is not so important. It's no. The decision is learning how to make the best decision that's important. Exactly. Because and, whether you win or lose the hand, that's sort of a luck factor. But... Uh, it's because you might make decisions that are low probability to win, but still the best decisions. Correct. So as I'm trying to get advice from you, I need to be 
working within this structure so that I can give you this context. Because if I'm if you don't demand that same context from me every time, it's too easy for me to only give you the details that argue for the answer that I want. And I may not even realize that I'm mm-hmm. doing it, right? So as long as we have, we've agreed to this, the structure of the conversation, the details that need to be shared, and then hopefully we've also agreed to something else, which is that I don't tell you the outcome. Because again, once I tell you the outcome, it's going to create this situation where we're probably reasoning to try to make that make right. sense within that. So the way that I'll do it is I say, I have a question. I'm trying to figure out if I played this hand well. I provide all of these details that we've agreed to that are essentially templated, right? We, so it's like this architecture to the discussion. And then I describe the hand only up to the point where I have a question and no further. And I don't tell you what happened after that. It's like newspaper headlines, like, you know, stock market went down yesterday because of oil fears. They just make up the, yeah, all do. we know, is all, the only actual news is that the stock market, market went, went down. down. But then they try to backfill it and, oh, there's oil fears or North Korea fears or whatever. Right. And it's really bad because now when somebody reads that headline, um, they, you've now infected them with the conclusion that you've come to. And so I'm now going to start reading the story infected with this conclusion that it's because of oil fears. And I'm going to be noticing stuff that confirms that conclusion. I'm not going to notice things that disconfirm it. And now I'm probably going to infect other people with the same thing. So I'm trying to, in order to really be an efficient learner and really steal some of Eric Seidel's 10,000 hours, I want to quarantine off the things that might bias the advice that he gives me. And I want to give him a structure to the conversation where the advice he gives me has high fidelity. So let me ask, like, let's say a certain types of decisions or skills he took four or 5,000 of his 10,000 hours to learn. Do you really think without playing all the hands yourself, you can learn to be almost as good at that skill as him? Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Every podcast I do is so personal and special to me. The podcast is all about how people can be better performers, even peak performers at whatever it is they're passionate about. So help people discover this podcast. Help me, help the listeners. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever it is you get your podcasts. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltitude.com slash podcast. And also, if you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltitude.com. Once again, thanks so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. So let me ask, like, let's say a certain types of decisions or skills he took four or 5,000 of his 10,000 hours to learn. Do you really think without playing all the hands yourself, you can learn to be almost as good at that skill as him, let's say some micro skill in poker. I think I think with practice. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, there's a field practice component, of learning uh, w- with actually applying it at the table mm-hmm. and practicing and going back so that I can say, you know, I was trying this and I'm not sure if this was exactly the right situation or um, because there's certainly nuance to everything that you do, right? I can, uh, you can be if we're salespeople and I'm trying to teach you how to be really good at selling. Um, I can give you some of some really good strategies and some structure within which to think about how do you pitch and how do you close and those kinds of things. But then you have to go apply them and come back and say, in this situation, this is what I was doing. Was that right? So that you're creating this really nice feedback loop, which really, really speeds the learning up. And that, and that, and Anders Ericsson, uh, the, the, the real developer of this, this 10,000 hour role, calls that deliver practice where you, right. you know, get expert advice, you apply it, uh, and then you, you, immediately go into the feedback loop with the expert and uh, and apply it again and so on. Right. And here's the thing. I mean, you really do cut a lot of hours off. So as an example, you, you talked about, you referenced earlier that my brother had given me a list of hands to start with. Now, that list of hands was a beginner's list. It was, you know, only play these particular hands. And it was much too rigid for any kind of long-term poker success. But for somebody who was a beginner, it was an excellent list to start with. And that cut off a lot of hours because I came down at the table, 
you know, as a beginner with at least a reasonable starting set of hands that I did not have to come to myself through my own experience, experimentation and failure. And now, did I have to refine it afterwards? Sure. But it cut off this huge part of the beginning of just losing a lot of money as you try to learn, sort of through the school of hard knocks. He just short-circuited that for me and said, here's this list of hands you should start with. Here's why, you know, here's because these these tend to make good hands for this reason, whatever. And then, you know, off I went and played. Now, later on, I realized, oh, I need to expand on that and I need to refine it and I need to do that. But it cut off a lot of hours in the beginning of just experimentation on my part. Yeah, and I, I want to I wanna add two more things to the community thing. One is, is that uh, virtual experts is also a valid community. So like sure, I, of course. I mentioned earlier Gus Hansen because... That was probably the last poker book I read. He had such a great poker book where mm-hmm. he just describes hand by hand mm-hmm. what he, situation he's in and what he's thinking. And that by itself is yep. kind of a putting myself with, uh, you know, borrowing his 10,000 hours based on his download of knowledge into a book. So there's, there's even if you don't have like, you know, someone you know who's already in the upper echelons of mm-hmm. success in your field, you can still get some or most or part of that benefit, if not all of it. I don't know. I think that you can I think you can get quite a bit of the benefit and I don't want to discount the benefit that you can get from people who are at the same level as you are as long as the people who are at the same level that you're working with have the same commitment as you do to being open-minded, exploratory, uh, committing to trying to make your beliefs as accurate as possible, be as open as possible to dissent and really try to seek the truth together as opposed to being in a group which is the way that groups tend to go which is all about rah, rah, we're great, everybody else is dumb. Um, And, you know, I I think that we're all pretty sensitive to this kind of echo chamber, us versus them kind of mentality. And you can get it in groups of peers as well, you know, where uh, the poker example would be, you know, it's the group that's sitting there saying like, I can't believe how bad they play, they're so bad. I, you know, whenever I lose, I'm just unlucky. When I win, I'm fantastic. And then your friend is saying, yeah, me too basically, and you're right, and they're all just bad players, and I can't believe they think that that strategy is good. And then you'll get groups of players who are exploratory in thought where they'll come across somebody who's doing something unusual. And instead of just saying, well, I can't believe that guy's such a donkey, he's such an idiot, they'll say, they're doing something unusual, let me ask you about it. Like, Because maybe there's something to it. Like, maybe I shouldn't just be dismissing them out of hand. But you and I have to have made an agreement to that kind of talk between the two of us. I think that that's, that's critically important. And, I, and you kind of outlined in the book all the sort of almost bad language to look out for. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they just got lucky or they were, they were they were really bad. I shouldn't have lost or right. whatever. There's all these kind of like... Or well, just or just being this, this. How about you tell me an opinion and I say you're wrong. Right. So, so, it's, so it's a matter of kind of... Uh, Taking more personal responsibility, and, and and again, this is like a meta skill to learning. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like there's like skills to be a better learner, and then you apply them to what you're learning. But like a skill to be meta learning is to avoid this kind of like blame game, whether it's luck or other people or someone stupid, and you know all all this sort of nonsense language that you would never hear a pro speak about. Right. And then um, you know. Again, there's someone who's with you, who's just as passionate, who's trying to find all those micro skills, and they're serious about learning. They're not going to kind of, um, you know, they're, they're going to figure out how to communicate with each other to to improve the learning. Yeah. So, and I think that this is a natural tendency, and you want to try to catch it whenever you're doing. So, obviously, you're working on this comedy thing this year. I assume when you're going up, you're hearing there. There's a certain uh, set of the people that you interact with who come off the stage and they just complain about the audience. Now, the audience... That, that's, like, that's like almost everybody. Right. So the audience may, in fact, not be fantastic. I don't know. But it certainly can't be the case that every single time you come off the, audi- uh, off the stage and you've had a bad set that it's the audience's fault. And I gather that those people probably aren't going to move forward in terms of progressing in their comedy as quickly as someone who comes off the stage and doesn't say, oh, it was such a bad audience, but instead instead says, do you think that was a bad audience? Or I have some ideas about why my jokes were falling flat. Again, I think personal responsibility is key. Like, so whether you're learning poker or chess or golf or investing, like you see this all the time in investing. Someone makes an investment, 
then there's news, the stock goes down and they're crushed for the day. Mm -hmm. And they get really disappointed. Like, oh, if only that news hadn't come out, I would have won big on the day. Okay. But, but, but you kind of have to take personal responsibility for your position size, mm -hmm. for, for how you hedged, for how you were planning on, did you have a plan in place to take into account surprising news? So personal responsibility is a really big part of this, I think. Right, so... I, or the, the crowd, I, I always assume the crowd's never a bad crowd. That there's always something I could have done with any crowd. That that's a, such a great stance toward trying to learn. So when I talk about what what forms a really good learning group, um, I say you have to agree to three things. One is a commitment to accuracy. So a commitment to accuracy is to say that there's a difference between being accurate and right. Uh, most of us approach the world with with the idea that we want to be right. Um, and what I mean by that is that I come in I come in and I have certain beliefs. And I just want my beliefs to be right. I don't want to change them because that would mean I was wrong. Um, and if you approach the world with this idea that I have a commitment to accuracy, it's this belief that, well, your beliefs are under construction. That we can't be certain of anything because gosh knows we don't have all the, you know, we, we just can't collect enough information to, to get to a real place of certainty about most things. Um, we can get close like the earth is round. Uh, but most things aren't as adjudicated as the earth is round yet. So for, for most kinds of beliefs we have, particularly when, we, when it's things like, why did the stock market fall? There's just a lot of hidden information in the system. There's a lot of luck that makes it very hard for us to be certain of it. So we view the belief as under construction, that we're trying to get to the objective truth. We'll agree that there's an objective truth that we're trying to get to, certainly. But that our representation of that exact... Uh, you know, our representation of that, that objective truth is in progress, let's say. Um, and so, that we're so, searching so for accuracy. The direction is more important than being perfect. Correct, exactly. That we're always trying to move toward a better representation of the objective truth. And we're doing that together. So that's part of the commitment of the group. The next piece, which is what you said about personal responsibility, is that we're accountable. That we have to be held in some way accountable to the beliefs that we have. Now, one of the ways to be held accountable to a belief is actually through a bet. If you and I disagree, if we have opposing beliefs, we can place a bet, and the bet will act as a referee for who's got the more accurate belief. Okay, right? let me question that. So, so, uh, but just because I lose the bet doesn't mean I'm wrong. Over either. the long run, right? Over the long run, but then that's that's Correct. difficult to execute between in a group. Um, so unless you're like, committed I, I don't, for a long time, I don't actually think that in the group we should be placing money against each yeah. other. I'm saying that in general, like betting is is sort of a mechanism of accountability. That if we have opposing beliefs, uh, a bet can essentially act as a refer a referee. But with your friends, you don't want to go around saying like I'm challenging you to a bet all the time. That's, well, that's like, not a, a good a thing. A bet, I think, also calculating the odds too, right? Because the odds are part of the bet as well as the money component. Right, or, or so you want to you want to place a good bet, not not because necessarily the outcome went one way or the other, but uh, you want to look at whether you were actually getting a good price, right? Did, right? Was the market paying you enough for the bet that you were placing? But when you're in when you're in this group setting, when you're trying to form a really good decision group, you've got this commitment to accuracy and then an accountability to your beliefs. So, for example, I'm going to hold you accountable to the way that you're. Uh, asking me questions to the way that you're describing the world in the way that Eric Seidel held me accountable. When I came up to him and I said, I can't believe how unlucky I got, he held me accountable to that kind of worldview and said, why are you talking to me like this? I don't want to hear that. Do you have a question? So I'm accountable to the way that I'm processing the world there. Another form of accountability is let's say that you've made some sort of commitment and the group knows that you've made that commitment. So um, as an example, you, you decide, I'm not going to eat bread. Well, the group can hold you accountable to that and they say, hey, how'd you do on that no bread eating yesterday? And you're now accountable to the group for whether you ate bread or not. Um, if you have a stop loss in some sort of investment situation, it can, they can hold you accountable to your stop loss. Um, if, you tell, if you say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this position on and unless these factors change... I am not going to cash out of this position. Like, this is what I've decided. I've worked through the decision. I've decided that the probabilities are right. And these particular things would have to change in the market in order for me to cash out. And I want you to help hold me accountable to that. No matter what, ha then when the start stock market crashes, you know, almost 1,200 points on Monday, you, you can hold me accountable to not cashing out of my position just because that happened on a short-term basis. Because I've told you in advance the things that would cause me to actually change my position. 
right? So we, there's all different ways that you can have this accountability mechanism within the group. And then what's really wonderful is not only is the group holding you accountable, accountable in the moment, but when you're off on your own and you're thinking about breaking that thing that you've said that you're accountable to, you'll stop for a second. It will stop you mid-action and you'll think, oh no, I'm going to have to go talk to James about this. And he's going to question me about it. You get in my head. You mentioned in the book something great that I didn't think about, which is almost like negative visualization. Like if you if you if you're thinking of breaking kind of your parameters or your your promise, think of the negative consequences rather than visualizing uh, the positive things. Mm -hmm. If you kept with, so so think of the negative consequences of breaking as opposed to the positive consequences of sticking with your rules. So if you're trying to lose weight, don't think about how great you're going to look if you keep on losing weight. Think about how bad you might look or feel or illnesses you might have if you start eating like crap again. So so that's that's one really good thing to do. And, and another one is, is, is to be prepared. Try to get as clear a map of the future as you possibly can. So this, this means that you have to admit that you're not sure of how the future is going to turn out, which is really hard for most people. Most people want to know for sure. Like, I know it's going to, this is going to work out for me, right? I know this is going to go well. If instead you approach the world as, I want to get the best view of the landscape as I possibly can, in order to get a really good view of the landscape, and we can think about it as like a military analogy, it's really good for you to know where the mines are. So, What do you, you mean, oh, where the mines are? Where the mines are. Um, you know, where the bumps in the road are, where the, where the hazards lie ahead, where there might be barbed wire in the way. Um, so if we take the example of, let's say that I want to lose weight, and one of the things that's motivating me is I'm sort of having this positive visualization of like, oh, I'm thinking about this future and I'm thin and it's all great and now I have a boyfriend and everybody thinks it's wonderful and all my clothes fit and I look great and I get a promotion and you're, you're imagining this positive future. What happens to you then when you lose weight and you don't get a boyfriend? that can cause you to actually fall off of the wagon Mm, mm. and actually lose the commitment because you haven't thought about, well, what happens if it's bad? So it's not just like what I have to think about what happens if I fall off the wagon. You do want to think about that, but you also want to think about the hazards that lay ahead. Like what am I going to do when there are donuts in the break room? I got to think about that so that I have some sort of plan in place. But then also what's going to happen if the thing that I want happens and I still don't get the future that I'm envisioning. Um, so that you can be prepared and then you can you can start to think about that. Well, why am I really losing weight? Is it really just to get a boyfriend or is it because I want to be healthy? Am I assuming that if I'm healthy and happier, then in general things are going to work out better and maybe that will be farther down the road? You can start to get plans in place so you're not as shocked when all of a sudden you step on a mine, number one. And number two, because you've planned ahead for those donuts in the break room, you're just like less likely to step on the mine in the first place. So, so uh, I just want to I want to get back one second to the community thing, Please. which is also that you know we talked about a couple of ways to get community. One is if you already know people. Mm-hmm. The other is virtually through books, or whatever. But there's also kind of like a backdoor way. So I think about Judd Apatow, who's amazing uh, director of all these comedy movies. He's done like every comedy movie in the past twenty years. But he, as a kid, when he was in high school, he. Um, Created a radio show and literally flew around the country interviewing. Even he even even interviewed Jerry Seinfeld as a high school kid. Jerry Seinfeld didn't realize a high school kid was coming to interview him, but he kind of did this backdoor way of creating mm-hmm. something that gave him an excuse to talk to all these people to ask hundreds of questions. And then he filled a whole book out of that. You know, he wrote a book recently detailing his experiences doing that. So I think, and for me, a podcast is a great excuse yeah. to call you and say, "Hey, let's." talk about all your ideas about learning and decision-making and so on. So I think there's always some backdoor way where you can get to talk to these people as well. I agree. And and I think that, uh, you know, the other thing you can do is like, I think Ryan Holiday has a really good um, uh, story in terms of how he created community for himself of people who were like interested in what he had to say that he could interact with. He was like, okay, well, I want to build community, but nobody really knows who I am. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm interested in books, he said. So I'm just going to create a newsletter where I recommend books. 
you know, and it started with like, you know, he slowly but surely got it to like a couple hundred people. And then eventually it was 2,000 people, you know, because people were sort of, yeah. you know, because he created Realized this Ryan really Holiday's great. Ryan Holiday's been on this podcast like six times. Well, I love Ryan Holiday. So he's, great. he's probably told you this story about his newsletter with the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. No I, doubt. I, um, and that, I think that's a really good example. He was like, well, how do I start communicating with people? What's a thing that I like? Um, and then, you know, he started small. The thing is, I think it's really important to realize that you don't have to start like, as a best-selling author or a huge TV star or whatever, you can literally just start off talking to three people. And, you know, as you create a great conversation and as you find what your conversation is, naturally you will start expanding your community and you're going to be able to get more and more input and more um, insight. The other thing is that the more open-minded you are to people who disagree with you, the bigger your community will be and the more useful it will be because you won't be swatting people away just because they have a different viewpoint than you do. Um, and that's always going to expand your community and it's going to make your beliefs more accurate because the more that I can hear somebody who disagrees with me, either it's going to stop my truth from atrophying. So if you disagree with me and it turns out that my truth is more more sort of an accurate representation of the objective truth in yours, at least I'm going to have to be defending it. But that's going to be rare. Most of the time, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. And because I'm willing to have that conversation with you, we're both going to hopefully get to a more accurate place where we, we end up moderating our opinions to better represent the truth because we've agreed to talk to each other in the first place. Um, and I think that's hard for most people. When most people feel like someone disagrees with them or have a differing opinion, they feel like it's a threat to their identity and they'll swat it away. And that naturally shrinks your community down. Yeah, and on both sides. Like you see, and you mentioned the example of, uh, of and so now we're going on the decision-making side. You mentioned the the the... Nate Silver, mm-hmm. and uh, he he runs that great site five thirty eight dot com, which was which is uh, has always been good at predicting polls and predicting the accuracy of or or, or, or guessing the accuracy of who's going to be president or who's going to win what election. And you mentioned how um, he had predicted Trump at thirty or forty percent before the election, and Hillary at let's say I guess the opposite fifty or sixty or sixty or seventy percent. Now after Trump won, everybody trashed. Nate Silver. So there's this, there was this, an ugly thing happened, which happens on the internet often, which is that there was hate because someone seemed wrong and stupid. There was so it gave people an excuse to hate him, mm-hmm. and he had to deal with that psychologically. I guess I haven't spoken to him about it, but uh, but the point you make, which is very interesting, is that he might have been dead right the whole time in the sense that maybe there was a thirty percent chance that Trump would win. And okay, 30% is actually a fairly big number. Three out of 10 times, someone will win who has a 30% yeah. chance. Well, I think what happened was the pundits had a really huge rounding error. <laughs> so they rounded from 30% to 100, I mean, you know, so, uh, to, or to zero rather. They rounded down and, from 30 And you 30 say that's a number zero. is that people tend to, when they're making decisions, tend to round to zero or 100. Or 100 and that's a big because they want, they want to know what's the right answer. And so they don't want to hear you know, Clinton's going to win 65% of the time. They're going to be like, well, I don't know what the, does that mean she's going to win? It's like, well, she's going to win 65% of the time. Well, what does that mean? Who's right? What, is she going to win? But if they so, confuse it with an actual poll. Exactly. So so the pundits, um, you know, were saying, you know, Clinton's going to win. Nate Silver was saying it was somewhere between uh, 60 and 70% of the time that she was going to win. And just to give you an idea of how often that would happen, and this is really taking an analogy from Nate Silver, that's as often as like Monday and Tuesday happen in a week. Actually, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and a half. Hmm. Right? So it's like Monday, Tuesday, half of Wednesday and a week. How often does that occur for you? Like how often is that coming up for you? That's how often he was predicting that Trump would win. So that's a lot. So the fact that Trump won doesn't say anything about whether his polls were wrong. It, in fact, even if he said that Trump was going to win 2% of the time, the fact that he won on the one election wouldn't say whether his prediction was correct or not because 2% is not zero. Right, so the, here's the one pushback I have on that. And there's kind of a, the example holds in poker, but you have pot odds there to help you determine if your probabilities are useful to you or not. So leaving that aside for a second, what use is it for Nate Silver to say somebody's got a 30% chance of winning? Like, how does that help him make any decision? And well, how does he know that 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 accuracy? I mean, he kind of averages all the polls and all this other stuff. Yeah, but- so, so he has an algorithm that looks at all the polls. Um, 
he has stated very clearly that his uh, that national polls are always more accurate, just simply because you get a better and more diverse sample, and the 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 polling methods are are better in in terms of methodology. Um, so the national polls had Clinton, you know, between two and three percent. Surprise. <laughs> That's what she won. And then he said the problem with a lot of the state polls is that the confidence intervals are very wide, uh, particularly when you look at some of the actual key states like New Hampshire. Um, it's very hard to read what those polls are just because of the the sampling methods that they're using and some things that have to do with demographics in New Hampshire. And he was really clear about that. What What's the use of it is that if we want to start to think about how do we make decisions about the future, what what are our choices in terms of our actions? We want to think about what are the probabilities of different futures occurring. Now, the way that we can judge whether Nate Silver has a good algorithm is to look across all of his election prediction. So as, as we're seeing him predict Senate races and presidential elections and other presidential elections and midterm elections and um, you know uh, special elections and things like that, we start to get a body of data that tells us what does his algorithm look like. So that's over the long term. And then we we use that in order to say, okay, he's giving us some idea of what the percentage of thing A or thing B is, and that's going to help us decide what um, kinds of actions we're going to take. Or, or now, let's say if you if you were a candidate, you could say, okay, he seems to be good at a national level, not so good at a state level, so we're going to mm-hmm. pay attention to, or he's good with these states but not those states, Correct. so we'll focus on these states if we're going to use his data. Right, so if you have a very good polar at least in far as presidential elections, it might tell you where you want to focus. It might tell you where you want to be uh, putting ads. It might tell you how much danger you're in. It might tell you, depending on whether you want Trump or want Clinton, um, whether you're willing to go out with a clipboard and start to get out the vote, right? So, for example, uh, let's say that um, you have some value to your time. And you're trying to decide, okay, on Tuesday the 8th, do I want to be out there with a clipboard you know, trudging around, or do I want to spend time with my children or do any of the other things that I do? And let's just say, for example, that um, let's just say you really wanted Clinton to win. If if Nate Silver's telling you it's 98% to 2%, you know, okay, you might not go out with your clipboard, but if he's saying it's 60-40 and you really do have a dog in this race, then you might say, you know what, on this day, I'm willing to forego the other options that I have for this day in order to try to get out the vote because I understand that it's close. And that's no different than, um, like, if you're just trying to order something in a restaurant and you're trying to decide between the chicken and the fish, you're essentially doing the exact same thing, thing there. You're trying to decide in which future am I happier and kind of how confident am, am I in that, right? So I think that 70% of the time that I order the chicken, I'm going to be happier than if I ordered the fish. Because that's sort of how I feel about, you know, chicken versus fish. But there's this 30% in there where the chicken comes and it's dry as a bone and the sauce is horrible and it's really just hor- it's awful and I really wish that I'd ordered the steak. Well, now I'm going to... I mean, gonna, I'm a vegan, so I don't want either. I just want to say that, but whatever. But I'm going to... This is a good segue into your... The, the neural time traveling you talk about also towards the end of the book about decision making, which is... Um, you can look at a decision and how you feel about it now and the anxiety it makes you feel now, say, but you could say, how am I going to feel about this 10 years from now? Correct. Am I really going to look back at this decision and say it was important in any way? And if it is important, why is it important? So you might you might like chicken better than fish, but you might say, well, if the chicken was not raised wild or organically, it might be unhealthy, whereas fish has got all these like great omega-3 oils and if I eat in 10 years, I'm going to be a healthier person mm-hmm. with, with less cancer or whatever. Uh, so, so, or, or you could say, look, it doesn't matter at all. 10 years from now, I'm not going to think at all what, what, what I consistently was eating right now. So I think that's a useful, very useful thing. It's, we always think that right now, oh my gosh, this, this, which shoes should I pack for this trip? This is like really important. Uh, but like five years from now, it's not going to, I'm never once going to think about and the importance of it will have no effect on my life whatsoever five five years from now. It, well, yeah. So I think the example that I give in the book of the importance of doing that kind of mental time traveling in order to be a more rational decision maker is that, so we get really caught up in, we really, really get caught up in the moment. And how we feel in the moment and the kinds of decisions we're going to make and the way we're going to process uh, what's happening in our lives really matters in terms of the how did we get to the moment that we're in and then we just live in that moment. So let me give you a couple of examples that you'll you'll know from the book. So 
I say, okay, so let's say that you go and you play blackjack. And you, you go with your friends and, you know, you're going to play for like two hours. And in the first half hour, all you do is get blackjack. Just blackjack, blackjack, blackjack. You can't lose a hand. You end up up, say, $2,000. And it's just because everything went your way. But your friends are still playing, so you continue to play. And over the next hour and a half, you lose all but $100 back. You know, how are you feeling about that? Right, so you're feeling horrible even though you're up $100. Even though you're up $100. Now we can do the reverse. You start off the night and you literally can't win a hand. I mean, it's just horrible and you really want to quit and you're kind of sour about it because you're down $2,000 because the dealer has just, you know, hit 16, hits a five, hit 16, hits a five, you know, just every single time. And you're down $2,000, but your friends are like, oh, come on, come on, let's keep playing. So you continue to play and all of a sudden you start getting blackjack every single hand for the next hour and a half and you end up only losing 100. How do you feel about that? And, you know, the drinks are on you. You're like super happy. And notice that that's really in the moment decision making. In, in one case, you're very sad that you won $100. And in another case, you're quite happy that you lost $100. And that's, I think, a very puts into very sharp focus how irrational we can be in the way that we process our outcomes when we're caught in the moment like that. Now, if I got you to do a little bit of mental time travel, and I said to you, hey, imagine it's, it was a year ago that you went to that casino. Now, which result do you prefer, the $100 win or the $100 loss? If it happened a year ago. If it happened a year ago, you would just say $100 win. Of course. So what happens is that when you can take that extreme zoom lens off, where you're just zoomed in on the moment and kind of what's just happened to you, and you can put on a wide-angle lens and, and get that so that you can see it within the scope of time a little bit better and when, within the scope of what the arc of, of the way that your whole life goes, then you start to get much more rational about it. Because what we really are looking for is to think of ourselves like a happiness stock, where we want the slope to have a general upro- upward trend, and we understand that there are going to be momentary upticks and downticks, but we don't want to be yanked around by those too much because the more that we're yanked around by the momentary up and upticks and downticks, the less likely we are going to have that upward slope because it's going to cause us to make really silly decisions like being super happy that we lost $100, which is a little bit crazy. Um, so and you so can- how often would you apply this method of decision making in your life like does the decision have or or not decision making but in terms of point of view let's say a type of po- this type of point of view does the does the kind of um uh intensity level of the moment have to be a certain level because you can't do this over oh should i boil the eggs or scramble the eggs like you <laughs> no. can't do it over everything um you know is it something where only intensity level is so high or well, I, I think and that, you have to train yourself to think this way. Sure. I, I think there's two things. One is when you're just struggling with a decision or you see somebody else struggling with a decision. So I use this with my children all the time when they're very, like they come home from school and they're really upset because they got in a fight with their friend. And I'll use this method all the time. I'll say, do you think this is really going to matter in like a month? And they'll be like, no. Because they'll be like, yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I've gotten in a fight with them before and it's been fine. So, so basically what you're doing is you're transforming them into a different person the person they'll be in a month mm-hmm. and saying, is it important to that person? I'm getting them to have a conversation with the future version of them. So I'll, I'll give you something similar that that I do, which is almost similar to this. So let's say there are three types of decisions I normally make. One I'm bad at, two I'm good at. So let's say I'm bad making decisions on personal relationships, but I'm good making decisions on business relationships mm-hmm. and I'm good making decisions on advice for my kids. Uh, so if my... So, let, so to take the exact same problem, my kid presents me with the problem, suddenly the answer becomes really clear. Like if I have, the, if I have the, let's say I have a personal relationship issue, I might not have any clue what to do. Mm-hmm. But then if, I, if my kid comes to me with the exact same problem, I might 100% know what she should do. Or if, some, or if somebody's interacting with me in a business situation, how I'm being interacted with in a personal situation, I might know 100% what to do. So I kind of do a version of this, but instead of time traveling for myself, I do the... Like situation traveling. Yeah, I do situation traveling. So I, I love that. That's not in the book. I wish it were. <laughs> well, I'm going to start using the time traveling, which yeah, I Yeah, well, okay, so we'll exchange <laughs> yeah. because I think situation traveling is also really right, good. Does that mean we're like in the same peer group for yeah, decision making? Yeah, I love that. So um, this goes back to community. So let's add a fourth community. So you talk about community of peers, 
community where you're where you're talking to experts and community where you're teaching beginners and then let's have a fourth community which is a community of different versions of you okay right so there's right. situational there's time, there's time. Travel, um there's completely different right uh you know uh, where you really think about counterfactuals like well what if i had been born in a different country so that would be a different right. version of you that you could interact with as well where you're thinking about like counterfactual you so I, I think that, but, we, but then you have to get in. There's the danger of it being silly, like because in there, there's cases where okay, I was born in America. Uh, obviously, it's better than if I was born in some third world country which doesn't have enough food. So. Well, I, I would say that in that particular situation, uh, it might be really useful to ask um, just to understand for certain questions, like as, as you're trying to, how much credit should I take for the outcomes in my life? So it would be good to say, well, what if I'd been born in another country or, um, you know, in different economic circumstances or at a, in a different time period? Do I think that I would have had the same trajectory, for example? So that will help you give you some perspective on what should you be, um, you know, sort of taking credit for? What should you say? Well, this was lucky, but within the 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 situation in which I was born with, I think that I made pretty good decisions along the way, but I certainly like had a leg up or I didn't have a leg up or... You know, I think it allows you to kind of put things into context when you think about, well, what if what if the situation had been different? What if I didn't have the education that I did? Or what if those kinds of things? I think it's just helpful to sort of work through those kinds of questions of, um, you know, what should I be taking credit for and what shouldn't I? You know, and I think this is where, uh, you know, looking at perspective and looking at context is really important. I would say the reason you came up with the ideas in this book is not just because of who you are naturally, and you're obviously an inquisitive person. You're you're almost academically minded. You were going for a PhD before you became a poker player, but poker itself is unlike a job where every day you go in the job and every two weeks you make money. Yeah. So it's a slightly smoother happiness curve. Now you might not be happy, but no matter what, it's not going to have as much volatility. It does like, not have as much volatility. But like poker, where I used to be a day trader, for instance. Yeah. You might actually. There might be days where you lose money. Very. There might be like ten days in a row where you right. lose money. Are you kidding? And money is so important to our how we feel about ourselves. And uh, there's no other. There's very few jobs where you go to work and then you lose money by the end of the day. Like yeah. it's po games like poker where you're gambling or investing or day trading. More likely day trading than than investing. So you kind of have to learn that if I'm going to get better at this, I have to deal with the psychology. Mm -hmm. I can't just go around blaming people because then I'm wasting so much energy. And I'm just using now as one example. There's a thousand examples. Yeah. You can't, energy conservation becomes extremely important. And 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 part of that is you're emo, uh, balancing the emotions of both ups and downs. That's why I say a winning day is just as much a hot, hot potato as a losing day. That's right. You know, you can't, if, you, if you're going to glorify one, you're going to feel horrible at the other. You have to keep it in balance. So I think it has to do with... Uh, I let me let me try to put your point into different words. I think that we have to redefine, and, and poker forces you to do this, day trading forces you to do this. And I think that we would be well to take this out of those areas into everyday life. Redefine what does it mean to be winning or losing. So yeah, if we define losing as at the end of the day I had less money, then we're probably going to get yanked around. If we find define winning is at the end of the day, I had more money, we're going to fall into that trap where we're taking too much credit for the win and that's a trap in and of itself. Or we're, we're not taking enough credit for the loss, we're just trying to offload the bad feeling of it. But if instead we redefine what it means to win as to learn, right? So whatever's happening, whether I'm having a fluctuation up or a fluctuation down doesn't matter. As long as I am grabbing as many learning opportunities as I can so that I have really interesting stuff to go talk to James about and we can now enter into this learning experience and you know what winning is for me? Going to you and saying, I won this hand, but I think I didn't play it very well. And then your face lighting up because now I've created this amazing conversation with you and we've engaged in this conversation where we can now learn together and you're giving me all this positive reinforcement for the fact that I'm not thinking about winning is just sort of the end result of the money that I'm going to and I'm saying, I know that I won money, but I don't think that that was actually winning because I think I could have played better. Can we talk about that? Or you know what? I lost 
And here's why I, th- I think that here were the bad decisions that I made as opposed to just like I lost and I got so unlucky, which maybe in the moment, remember we talked about temporal discounting in the moment, maybe that makes me feel better in the moment. You know, and I think, I think also uh, philosophically that's going to change the way that's going to change a lot of things other than just your emotional energy. You might, if, if the focus is uh, uh, you win, if you learn more, you might then reduce the consequences of other aspects of the of the moment. So you might play lower stakes so you can focus more on the learning. Mm-hmm. Or, or in, in day trading, you might have less position size. Or on a date, you might not be thinking, uh, is this my future spouse or not? You no. might just be saying, okay, how am I interact? How, am I am I speaking my own truth on the date? Am I I'll have a little more confidence? Is this am I really evaluating? Is this the right person for me as opposed to trying to please them? I'm speaking my own autobiography here. Um, but, <laughs> I like uh, that though. But but I think it applies to how you def- uh, recast the situation itself if you, if you change the definition of winning. Exactly. You know, I actually have an, an example from my own life. When I first started playing poker, I was playing a very particular form of poker called Limit Texas Hold'em. Um, and I had been playing that for quite a few years before I moved to Las Vegas and kind of declared myself to be a professional. So I'd started off playing in Montana, and that was the only game that they actually played was this limit Texas Hold'em, this particular form of poker. So I go to Las Vegas, and it turns out that in Las Vegas, the stakes only go so high in that particular form of game. And if you want to actually play for higher stakes, you have to include some other forms of poker, which include games that are called stud games. So I had never played any kind of stud games. So I was playing, you know, for the, for that time, somewhat high stakes in in um, uh, Limit Texas Hold'em. Like I would play up to two and four hundred dollar Limit Texas Hold'em if the game came up. The regular game was fifty and a hundred, about three thousand dollars at stake. But I realized that if I wanted to be putting more at stake, I had to learn stud. So I went off with my money and I started off playing five and ten dollar studs. So to give you a different in ma- difference in magnitude, in one game I might have three thousand dollars at stake. In this game, I have three hundred dollars at stake. So it's an order of magnitude difference. And I remember when I started doing that because my focus was on learning the game, not on kind of what the end result was money wise or anything like that. That people were talking. I heard rumors around my back about how I'd gone broke. And I thought it was very funny because, because I because it's like they always it's it's a status thing in Las right. Vegas what stakes table you're at exactly and I thought how funny that they think I went broke like do they not like I'm playing a completely different game than I've been playing before of course I'm playing smaller because what I thought to myself was well the way that I learned how to play limit Texas Hold'em was I started in these small stakes games and then I I worked my way up so if I'm going to go play this totally new form of poker for me I should probably do the same thing now I worked my way up a lot faster I got to the bigger stud games in about six months because, because obviously you I learned had, how to learn already right because I already had some poker skills exactly and I already understood how to process the game and what kind of questions I should be asking and things like that so it you know I probably did it about four times as fast. But I, I went back and I started at the beginning. Um, and I think about that in terms of that's the same idea of like, what's my purpose in going on a date? Am I, try, am I trying to learn from this experience and figuring out if I'm being authentic and I'm happy with how the date is going and that regardless of whether she wants to go out on a second date with me, I feel like I presented the version of me that I wanted to as opposed to thinking about like all these other sort of big issues or worrying, how about just worrying about whether she likes you, which may make it, good in the short run, but really bad in the long run is right. you've presented a version of yourself that isn't authentic to you anyway. That was the per- first 49 years of my life. <laughs> so well, there just you go. learning it's now. It's probably the first 49 years of everybody's life. To but, but, but again, that's a great situation where if my daughter came to me with the advice, I'd know what to say. If a business situation happened where I had to give advice, I'd know what to say. But in my own, pers- it took 49 years to, to learn <laughs> something close to that. Right. So... So it's interesting. There was, there was. So, so what would you say then is another? Just in terms of like hacking the ten thousand hours, even outside the context of this book, what would you say is another tip for you? Uh, so I, I think that one of the things that we haven't explored that much that that is in the book is this idea of being really, really open to dissent, hmm. because I think that's one of the best ways to hack the ten thousand hours. Because the, the, otherwise, what happens is that you'll sort of go down the path that you're already going down. Um, because we really like to affirm ourselves. And this is true, by the way, uh, even for groups of people who one would think are incredibly committed to searching for the truth. So, you know, judges, academics, they all fall prey to this 
closing themselves off to dissenting opinions because it just doesn't feel world, good, particularly in you, today's your world. Feeds on whatever wherever you're looking are are kind of programmed now to agree with you. Right. So you don't see dissent. So here's the biggest ten thousand hour hack that I can think of, and it has to do with this dissent issue. Is that the more that you're willing to embrace uncertainty and just say I'm not sure, the faster you're going to learn and the, the fewer hours you're going to need in order to actually get to expertise. So I think there's a few reasons why that is. One is, if you say I'm not sure, you're more accurately representing the world anyway. Because mm-hmm. about most things, we're not sure. And so uh, the more accurate representation of the world, probably the better our decision-making is. But the other thing is that I think that when you don't say I'm not sure, and instead you say, well, I'm certain that this is the way to do it, what happens is that you lose this hunger for information. Because if you're already certain, why would you ever seek out any new information? Because you already know, right? It's probably kind of the reason why when I said to you, well, you know, you should be able to defend the earth is round against a flat earther. You said, well, I don't actually know why. Why? Because you're certain of it. So you probably haven't searched to see, well, how would I actually figure out how to defend that, right? Which isn't that surprising because I'm not, I, I imagine you, you don't have a lot of reason to Right, like, defending like, that like again, it truth. takes energy to defend. So, like for instance, I'm not going to defend algebra right. because I, who I don't care if anybody knows algebra or not. I just know it's there, so I can borrow the ten thousand hours. Right. Uh, whoever Isaac Newton used to create algebra, I could just take it in one in, in a half a year and, and right. learn it. And, and that's all fine as long as when somebody says to you, "Why is the quadratic equation true?" You say, "I don't know." Like as long as you represent your knowledge right, like. Well, I'm I'm I I learned it and I know how to use it and I'm pretty sure it's true, but I can't actually explain to you why. Right, so you have to be uncomfortable, like for the things that are not high stakes for you or right. uh, high stakes for you. We're given poker, but things that are not like really important to you, it's okay to say I don't know. It's just what I believe. It's just what I believe, and that's fine as long as that's how you're. Re- because then what you're wrapping into there is I do, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's it just happens to be a belief of mine, and. W- then what's really good is if somebody says to you, "Well, why?" and and let's say it's your child. So you really want to be able to explain it. You're hungry for information because you have represented your knowledge as uncertain, yeah. right? So, so now you'll actually go and you'll seek out the knowledge to be able to explain it. But, but most of the time you don't need to, and that's totally fine. So you sort but of have to pick your spots where you, you really, have to pick your where spots. I'm not sure is, it does lead to that hunger. So I'm not right. sure why the quadratic equation is true. But you but don't, I don't really give care, a shit. Yeah. right? But if you're really trying to learn something, right? If I, if I'm really trying to learn it, yeah. poker or at, at uh, sales or in parenting or trying to be, become a better comic, then saying, I-, I think that this is the right way to go, but this is how sure I am as opposed to I'm certain that this is right. It causes you to be hungry for information and it causes you to go seek out other people who might have different perspectives than yours because those are the ones that are actually going to be the most helpful. I already know what I know. I already know why I believe the things that I believe, right? So, if I can go and find somebody who disagrees with me and be super open minded to it, then if I'm if I'm if I'm not saying I'm certain in the first place, then the fact that they disagree with me doesn't make me wrong. It just informs my belief because now we can have a discussion about it. And I think that's actually the biggest hack is the more you say I'm not sure, the faster you get to be an expert. And one of the things I think that distinguishes experts from other people is that they're much more aware of what they don't know. Hmm. That's interesting because actually thinking about the parenting thing, this applies extremely well to learning how to be a good parent, which is probably the hardest skill of all. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and so like, it makes me think of, um, you can't really, like this is one thing I learned early on, you can't really argue with your kids for what's rational because they're 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 somewhat irrational but they're never going to agree with you arguing with them right, about what's right. rational so you kind of have to figure out other ways around that and you still might and like you say you still might be wrong so you have to be open to what they're thinking as well so that they feel respected and you know yeah. and they're, that they're part of the conversation so all, all all of these ideas and techniques apply to parenting as well i have a, actually i think I think I have Straight the example. Book on parenting. Well, I think there's some parenting examples in that book. Uh, so here's one of the parenting examples in the book. Uh, I, you know, my kids, I think like like a lot of kids, um, when they do very poorly on the test, they want to be like uh, the comic who says it was the crowd's fault. So 
uh, they'll do poorly on a test. They'll come home and they'll be like, I can't believe the 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 teacher just really hates me. And then a good one is always like, oh, they put yeah, stuff right. on the test. They put stuff on the test that they didn't teach in class. I don't know if you've heard that, but I've heard that one a lot. There was stuff on the test that wasn't, they didn't even teach it in class. And the test was so hard and the teacher just hates me and you can ask anybody. So notice these are all things that are totally out of their control. Nothing to do with their own studying or how much they applied themselves or how well they listened in class or the kinds of notes they took. But that's all stuff that happened in the past. So I don't really see any use in disagreeing with them or trying to get them to more a more rational perspective in that moment because I think that's just going to get them emotional and it's going to create some combat between us. So instead what I do is I agree. I say, oh, wow, that's, yeah, that really sucks. So what are you going to do about that in the future? Like, have you gone and talked to the teacher to try to figure out if there are corrections that you can do on the test? Have you gone and, and made a meeting with them uh, to make sure that you're keeping up with what what to expect for the next test, how you could do better on the next test. Now, what's interesting is by focusing them on the future version of themselves, so now I'm kind of getting my future child to talk to my present child, is that in order for them to start think about, well, how could I do better on the next test, they now naturally have to go back and think about what could they have done better on this one. But I haven't pushed them there. I've agreed with them. So I'm no longer their enemy I'm just saying, hey, why don't you think about what you could do better in the future? Like, have you met with the teacher? Have you done these things? And then that will naturally cause them to circle back. And it's all through kind of, you know, nudging my kids to do some time traveling of their own. And and in the book, what, I like how you refer to this as, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a basic technique in improv. So yes, and. Yes, so it's yes, and. So yes, affirm what the situation is, that there's nothing's going to change the situation. Your beliefs about the situation are going to stay the way they are, and, and we have to build on that world. And then the yes, and. Right. Which is a technique number one in improv. Exactly. Um, and I think that it goes back to this community. You can have a community that you are very intentional with, where we've made an agreement that we're going to focus on accuracy, that we're going to hold each other accountable to our beliefs, and uh, we're going to agree to dissent with each other. So because we have an agreement, if you come to me and you say, oh, that really sucked because the crowd was so bad, we have an agreement, so I'm, not, I'm allowed to challenge you on that, right? So uh, I'm allowed to say, oh, come on. Like, really, do you think it was all the crowd? Do you want, you know, can we talk about maybe where your responsibility in that was? But we have an agreement to that. I don't think that I have an agreement with my children for that because they're kids. So, you know, I think that I'm supposed to say, okay, that's fine. Yes, it was the crowd. So now in the future, how do you think you can deal with bad crowds better? What do you think you could do to actually improve that mm -hmm. situation? And it's true for adults who aren't in agreement with me also. So I, I tell a story in the book actually about David, David Letterman and Lauren Conrad, oh, yeah. which I think is very demonstrative of this um, idea that if, if someone isn't a member of this intentional community that you've created where you have an agreement to dissent with each other and hold each other accountable in this way, that the way that you might want to handle it might be a little bit differently than this more sort of uh, direct challenge, right? That, that was a great story because basically they were having two different conversations. <laughs> they were. So she was having a conversation of just promoting the Hills. He was being David Letterman where he was just like sick of this and <laughs> um, he was just challenging, he was calling her an idiot or so to, more or less. Uh, and yeah. she didn't agree that that was part of the discussion. She wanted to have a promotional discussion. He wanted to have, well, let's uh, say, an a actual real discussion. discussion. Yeah. So, so just briefly so that people know what the hell we're talking about, Lauren Conrad was on, on a show called The Hills. Weirdly enough, by the way, a show that I never saw. I've never um, seen either. But I, 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 ha I saw this. It would happen in 2009, and I happened to see this particular episode of David Letterman, another show that I didn't watch that much after he moved away from NBC because I was in a hotel room that only had like three channels. And so I happened upon this, and it was like in the background. And when I heard this conversation, I immediately perked up. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's such an amazing example of – you know, self-serving bias and this bias thinking and how you talk to each other. And I said, I'm going to file that away. And I started using it in my talks because I thought it would make my talks more fun. So here's the situation. She's on the hills. It's a show about 20-somethings in LA who have all sorts of drama. So people may have heard of like Heidi and Spencer and, you know, they're causing all sorts of drama for Lauren. And, you know, I don't know, one of the Jenners was on the show and it was whatever, drama, drama, drama. So she goes on David Letterman to Brody promote Jenner. her show. Oh, okay. There you go. See, you know, <laughs> that's that's good. So she goes on the um, she goes on the show, uh, David Letterman. She's just there to promote the hills, and she's talking about you know all this drama is happening to me, 
you know, Heidi and Spencer are being mean to me and, you know, Brody's being mean to me and Stephanie's being mean to me and Audrina's being mean to me and blah, 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 drama, drama, drama. And David Letterman stops the conversation and says, well, that kind of raises the question, do you think it might be you? So, so she obviously, you know, doesn't take kindly to that. Now, uh, of course, by the way, he's making a very good point, which is you're saying all these things are happening to you. But what do you think your part in the drama might be? Anyway, she, you know, he sees, oh, uh, I just made the conversation go south. So he quickly tries to repair it. And what he says is, well, you know, let me give you an example from my own life. I used to, you know, for my whole life, I went, this person's an idiot, and this person's an idiot, and this person's an idiot, and this person's an idiot. And one day I said, wait a minute, could all these people be idiots? No, I don't think so. Maybe I'm the idiot. She says, are you calling me an idiot? So, I mean, obviously, the, the whole conversation goes completely south. Now, David Letterman was making a valid point. And had she been open to hearing what he was saying, open to the suggestion, open to the dissent, open to the way that he was trying to hold her accountable for the way that she was processing the things that were happening in her life, it actually might have been incredibly helpful for her. But they had no agreement to do so. Or... or she could have even have participated in an interest. She could have engaged in, in a way where she took control back of the conversation. She could she could have said something like, um, "No, not every cliche about people mm-hmm. is true." Right. And then now she takes control back. Exactly. So, but, but she she got into his world for a second just to take it back into her world. Exactly. So so yeah. So they had no agreement to this idea that we're gonna we're gonna work together as this cohort in order to check each other's biases and say, I I don't think you're actually processing the world in in a rational way, Lauren. Um, So that conversation went completely south. So I I say in the book that you want to be really, really careful of lettermaning people Um, and make sure that if you're talking to people who you don't have an agreement with, that you're doing yes and. You're saying, okay, so you can think about this yes and in terms of what could David Letterman said. Wow, you really have a lot of drama in your life, Lauren. What do you think you're going to do to make it there to be less drama in the future? So that's a way to yes end somebody. Mm, mm. Um, and that's not the way that I would do it with you. If you came to me and complained about the crowd, I wouldn't yes end you because we have an agreement not to do that. And we have an agreement to actually pull apart what actually happened and try to figure out what was the crowd and what was you. But most people you're not going to have an agreement with. So it's a lot better to yes end them. I love all these different ways of kind of hacking this 10,000 hour old. It's like we talked about like 20 different ideas here <laughs> and and sub ideas like not only community but how to break the community down, how to join different communities, how to find different community partners, how to look at decisions in all these different ways. Um and uh just out of curiosity, how how let's say let's say the 10,000 hour rule is true and that it does take 10,000 hour rule hours to reach your peak potential at something or some x number of hours. What percentage do you really think you can knock off? Uh, of that without just, uh, I don't know, without just putting in the time and... You know, I haven't really thought about it. I mean, first of all, first of all, I want to thank you because I, I think that this way that you're thinking about, like, let's set aside whether the 10,000 hours is true or whether that's the right number or whether it works for everything because, you know, obviously we could have a long conversation about that. But let's just take that as as a construct, you know, this 10,000 hours thing. I, I never really thought of my book as a 10,000 hours hack. And I really kind of like... I think it's much more than that, but yeah. But yeah no, no, I, I know that. I'm, I, I get I'm that. I'm mixing with your career and... Yeah, no, I'm not diminishing it. Yeah. I'm saying thank you because I think that's a really interesting way to think about the book. I, I like the frame of talking about it as a way to hack that. And um, I just really appreciate that because it, it's giving me actually a really fresh perspective on what what I wrote. Um, which I really like. So anyway, I'm very appreciative of that frame that you've offered to me about it being like, how do you how do you hack your way to expertise and sort of like you know knock off some of these hours that maybe you'd have to put in? So I, I just really like the frame. So I just wanted to oh, I, I just want to tell you I'm very appreciative uh, of it. I'm obsessed with that topic. So that's when I'm reading this. I'm thinking of two things. One is how does that, how do I make my life easier? Because emotional con- conservation is really important. Yeah. And then B, how to improve as fast as possible at anything I'm interested in. Um, I'm not 20, I'm 50. I want to, I'm not going to spend 20 years trying to get better at something. I want to yeah. learn to learn as fast as possible. And then in, in terms of what percentage can you knock off? I mean, my true answer is I, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I think that first of all, it probably depends on the thing that you're 
asking me to learn. Right, so I think that different... Like you mentioned violin versus poker. So you obviously believe right. in some degree of that talent plays a role as well. For sure. And I think there's difference between uh, activities that are more on the physical side of things and activities that are more on the mental side of things. So I think it's going to be a really different answer if you're trying to be a really good uh, sprinter um, you know, versus somebody who's trying to do something that isn't physical. Um So, but I imagine, you know, probably there's like a mix. So I bet, so it's probably better for like the marathon. Because I think think that certainly there's a lot of just sort of like what's your talent level at the marathon. But I also think that there's certain training methods you can learn. There's certain ways that you can sort of time your race, things like that, that would be really good hacks for that race. Where if I were able to talk to a community of experts, I could knock some, I could knock quite a bit of time off my own race. So I'd, I'd sort of be competing against myself in terms of how quickly could I improve. Um, whereas I think in something that's going to have uh, less ability to just hack it like um, a hundred yard dash, right? I, mm. I, you know, there, there I'm not sure. So the answer is I don't know because I, I haven't really thought deeply about this kind of frame. I haven't thought really deeply about w- what are the different types of activities and how would it apply to different types of activities, right? You, you know what I think about in terms of different types of activities? I like, want to know what your answer is. Well... I don't know because I've been, I mean, I've talked to hundreds of peak performers on this podcast and I think whatever number of hours it would take starting from scratch to, you know, claw your way up and be a peak performer uh, practicing inadequately, well, like without really thinking about the, the meta learning of learning, uh, I think you could probably take 60 to 80% off. So, so, oh, I like that. So someone with talent at poker could probably, and who's young could probably, you know, within two two years, probably be at least good enough to sit at a high stakes table. Mm-hmm. Maybe not win all the time. Yeah. But uh, you know, I remember what was the guy uh, Dan Negrino. You, you you know, he was a great poker player. But I remember like twenty years ago, he was a young kid, and already he was like shooting out of the cannon as a great right. poker player. So he had enormous talent, and he he understood some fundamental things, right. and he had a whole crew he was working with. So so uh, I think like sixty eighty percent. I think. Talent is often exhibited if you have a lot of passion for something. Right. So you're not gonna have. I'm not gonna have a lot of passion for running the marathon, but I might have a lot of passion for game playing. So I'll have, probably, chances are I have more talent at, at game playing than running the marathon. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be more willing to put in your hours at something that you feel talented at because it, you're gonna be getting a lot more positive reinforcement and you're gonna progress faster. I think and. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that you've just you've thought about this a lot more than I have, and so I would actually defer to you in terms of what your guess was, because I think your guess is going to be a lot better than mine. I guess it, I mean, look, it doesn't matter ultimately, because again, it's just is the direction right, and then you find out. Well, one one of the things actually I, I try to make really clear in the book is that when you're trying to apply these strategies, whether it's you know form a really good community, reframe the way you think so that you're embracing uncertainty, you're thinking about I'm not sure, you're trying to invite people to be your collaborators, you're doing to, you're trying to do this time traveling on your own, you're trying to be your own community, different versions of yourself, either situational you or future you or past you, that you're actually going to still not be very good at it. Um, and it's just because our brains are our brains and they're kind of built the way they are. But the good news is that you don't have to be that much better at it to get huge benefit. So, you know, I talk in the book about, let, let's say that, um, you know, when I first start playing, kind of left to my own devices, there's a hundred learning opportunities that cross my path and I catch five of them. So I'm missing 95% of the learning opportunities. Obviously, you know, the vast majority, um, I don't even see and I'm not paying attention to and I'm catching five of them. Okay, now let's say that I try to apply the strategies in this book and, you know, I don't even get close to perfect, but I do better. And now, instead of catching five learning opportunities, I catch 10. Well, you certainly can frame that as I'm still missing 90% of the learning opportunities that are available to me. I guess you could call me a failure in that sense. But compared to what I would be doing if I weren't applying these strategies, I've doubled my learning opportunities. So the version of me that is applying the strategies in the book is going to crush the version of me that isn't, even though I'm not coming anywhere close to perfect. And I think that that's actually a relief. I think that it allows you to have a lot more compassion for yourself that, look, I'm I'm never going to be perfect at this stuff. I am going to walk off a stage and my first instinct is going to be to blame the crowd. 
And that's mm-hmm. okay because that's just kind of the way my mind works. The question is, how often do I catch that mistake? Am I catching it more often than I otherwise would? And how quickly am I catching it? So it's almost like uh, not compassion for yourself if you give, oh, I just gave a bad talk. It's uh, compassion for yourself on the meta learning. Right. So, okay, okay uh, every now and then I'm not going to apply these meta learning techniques. I'm going to blame the crowd. That's okay too. As long as the direction is as long as you're going in the right direction, is the slope correct? And because again, not having compassion for yourself, like beating yourself up over that, again, it exerts emotional energy, which will defeat the purpose of learning the next time. Exactly. It's kind of like this idea of you know what? I can suck at this, and as long as I'm sucking less, it's all good. Because those small changes are going to have such a huge effect on on what the probability. Of of your you know sort of having good outcomes over your life right if I mean going back to we're trying to think of ourselves as a happiness stock and we want the slope to generally be an upward trend so if you're sucking less the probability that you have an upward trend to the sort of, sort of the trajectory of of whatever it is that makes you happy what whatever that is is just going to be so much higher because it compounds over time so you can think about like think about it is as, as if your decisions are a normal distribution, right? So you have your average decision obviously sitting in the center, and then you have your worst decision over at the left tail, and your best decisions are over at the right tail. Our goal is to try to get us to be sitting in the right tail more often than we otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, it doesn't, it's okay that sometimes you're still making a decision that's over at the left tail. It's okay that sometimes a lot of your decisions are still sitting smack dab in the middle. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Just try to get over to the right tail a little bit more often because that just in general shifts the distribution, right? Because if we're out at the right tail a little more often, we get to shift. Then the whole thing shifts right a little bit. And that that's what's going to get us to where we need to go. And it doesn't need to shift that much in order to really have big effects. I like I like how you take uh, compassion for yourself and turn it into like a normal distribution in statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so you draw from a lot of different fields to get to the key points of... I don't really know is the biggest hack for the 10,000 hours. Having good friends and community who are experts and learning how to communicate with them, uh, having compassion for yourself all through the process and all the other techniques we talked about for learning and decision-making I think are so critical. And I think about this all the time. This is a great book. Like I I said earlier, I've used this already, this book. I'm so happy. In three totally separate situations. Like, And I was able to recognize, oh, I'm just used a technique from you know, the, the the book. So the book's Thinking in Bets, Annie Duke. I hope you come on the podcast again next time you're in town. Anytime. This and is so fun. What, what, how often you're in New York? Well, I live in Philly, so I'm actually up here a lot. Now I feel like I have like Ryan Holiday goals. So, <laughs> what, what's a, what's a Ryan Holiday goal? Well, he's been he's talked to you like six times, so yeah, like, I now know. I have goals. You know, also when I first started this podcast, like at the end of twenty thirteen or early twenty fourteen, Ryan Holiday was the first producer of this podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It's because I we all it's it's community, so we all came out of this community of where we were trying to help each other build these new types I of media love and. That. So it was well, interesting. Uh, so let me tell you a secret about Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday. I won't Holiday, tell anybody. Nobody will. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ryan Holiday actually, he doesn't know it. I don't think, but he had a huge effect on this book, and I'll tell you why. So I'm sure you're familiar with um, "Obstacle is the Way" sure. and "Ego is the Enemy." So you know that that's written in these little tiny slices, where it's like these little sort of, sort of thousand wordish sections. Yeah. And. The way that that book is written, you could kind of open to anywhere in the book and you could read a thousand word section and you'd get a lot out of it. You'd know what kind of the point of that was. Would it be better if you read all the stuff that came before it? Sure, because it builds on itself. But each one has a very specific point that it's trying to get across. And it's almost like a a little mini um, essay within a very longer discussion on these issues. Um, And... That is why this book is written in that same format. Well, I one of my books, Choose Yourself, uh, is also written in that format because, and again, Ryan helped me with that book a little bit, but the idea is people don't have big attention spans. So you kind of have, a, anymore, like they're YouTube people, they're Instagram people, mm-hmm. you kind of have to fit everything into a thousand words or they for, for, for a concept or they lose interest. I'll, t- I'll tell you my Ryan Holiday story. Okay. So uh, we we did a podcast after every single one of his books. So after Ego is the Enemy, 
we go out to dinner and we were talking in general about jealousy and or or envy and um uh he asked an interesting question like picture, picture someone you're envious of and usually you're envious of someone not because of all of them but because of one feature like so and so has more money or so and so is a better athlete or so and so is better looking and then but he said ask yourself would you really want to completely switch places oh, and we kept yeah. trying to think of names both of us kept trying to think of names and there was no one we actually wanted to switch places with so that's that was just an interesting I love exercise. That. That's a, so um what's wonderful about that is so I sort of think about something that's in my book where I really talk about this idea of perspective taking it's to represent the idea exactly because that's a very that's a very strong technique in a lot of nonfiction and right it now. is not naturally the way that I write um the way that I write I, it tends to be more like tangenty and build up and, and it it completely cleaned all of that up for me so I am secretly incredibly grateful to Ryan Holiday so hopefully he'll hear this and he'll hear oh he'll hear the it. gratitude that I have. <laughs> For those two books, which are, I mean, first, I just love the books in and of themselves. I mean, I thought they were amazing. Um, but also the structure that they gave me that that I could really pull into this book, I, I think made this book so much better. Um, so I'm actually really grateful to him. Well, that's, I am too. Good. <laughs> so well, good we, we'll, Ryan, have a, we'll have a Ryan, Ryan Holiday, Holiday gratitude party. So, so, Annie, thanks for spending so much time. Uh, I, next time you're in New York or or... Anytime, just come on up here and we'll do another and we'll get, podcast. And we'll get Maria here as well. Oh yeah, Maria. We'll yeah. Get, so Maria Konnikova, who's been on the podcast before, uh, she, 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 we're planning actually. I've been planning on having her come on to talk about her her year in poker experience, yes. and obviously now it's turning into two. It's going to turn into the rest of her life. So, um, <laughs> but uh, she'll definitely come up here for the next one. So thinking and bet, we'll get Eric Seidel as well. Yes, we so, can have like that. Would be so fun. Yeah. Uh, so thinking and bets, I highly recommend it. Annie Duke. And if you like listening to this episode, please subscribe on either iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Many more fun guests coming up, I hope, according to my producer. We'll see. And uh, thanks once again. Thank you. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.